Recently I put out a short film, it's called Terry What I Am, and it's about an artist with a head injury uh, who's creating these beautiful sculptures. Today I'm going to use this film as an example to show you how I make a film like this on my own. I had to assume the role of filmmaker, director, DOP, editor, producer, blah blah blah. I'm hoping that you can learn from some of the mistakes I've made, some of the things I've picked up. So if you're interested in making documentaries or personal projects or micro budget films, hopefully this will give you a good insight into the things that I do to try and make nice little short pieces like this. So stick around. Uh, I'm gonna split the video up into three main sections, uh, pre-production, production, and post-production. So please, if you like this video, consider giving it a like. And obviously, if you're not, please subscribe to this channel. This film was commissioned by a charity, so it had a very small fee, uh, a very small commission. It was about £1,200 plus expenses. This had to include multiple filming days, gear, editing, grading, everything like that. So I knew I'd have to cover everything on my own. I guess, you know, it wasn't about the money for this. It was for a great cause. It's for the charity Headway East London. Uh, they're a fantastic charity that help people with brain injuries. You know, I think if you are going to sacrifice budget on a project, then you do need to be invested in it. Otherwise, you are just going to end up resenting it if you if it becomes a massive time sink. Obviously, if this budget had been for a corporate or commercial project, I probably would have said no, unless it was something really unique or exciting. It was going into an exhibition at the Barbican Centre in London, so there was a sort of a hard deadline point at which this project had to be done and out and delivered to the people installing the, the exhibition. Usually when a project has a hard deadline, it's sensible to deliver a week or so before just in case you know there are any last minute problems. Harry, the subject of the short doc, um, he was only on site on Tuesdays and Fridays and during those two days um, he was only actually in the studio for a couple of hours. Because of that, I knew I'd need multiple visits with my camera to get enough footage for a short piece. So, you know, I could have tried to just shoot it all in one day, but, you know, it just wouldn't have worked. It would have been super rushed. Um, I wouldn't have got all the coverage I needed. I wanted to take my time with this. I wanted to tell Terry's story and I knew sort of in order to capture the sort of heart and soul of this, of who he is, I need him to feel comfortable talking to me and that wasn't going to happen on the first day of meeting each other. Terry wasn't a big talker, he was quite shy and I knew that it would take him a while to sort of warm to me and get the sort of little bits of insights that I really wanted to get to tell his story faithfully. You know in smaller projects pre-production is usually the area you're going to sacrifice or compress the most. I did do a recce, generally this is pretty important, I think, to get an idea of location, you know, noise, the lighting quality. This recce day was also meant to be the day that I was to first meet Terry and sort of, you know, say hello, introduce myself, have a little chat with him, but, you know, unfortunately he didn't make it in that day and that was a bit of a shame because I didn't really want to be meeting him for the first time. Uh, on the first day of filming because, you know, I felt like the camera would sort of would hamper the rapport between us. In terms of planning the structure of the film and what the film was going to be about and all that sort of stuff, again, I knew there would be a certain degree of improvisation in this um, and that a lot of work would have to happen in the edit. I've made lots of sort of portraits and vignettes and films like this before, so I have a good idea of the sort of things you sort of have to capture or the minimum amount of stuff you have to capture to make these films work. So I knew the rough background about Terry's personal story, you know, that he'd been attacked, uh, which left him with a very severe brain injury, issues with mobility and speech. I knew about his art project and that he also had like a really good uh, friendship with one of the volunteers who he collaborated with uh, in making these artworks, who was called uh, Luca. So these were all elements that I would want to focus on on my shoot days. Um, I definitely want to draw out that relationship with Luca. I f felt like there'd be some really good opportunities for humour and warmth in that. I knew that there'd be a lot of work in the narrative because there's quite a lot of stuff to navigate through. So you've got the kind of like subject of his artwork, the sort of subjects around uh, his brain injury and overcoming that. And then also this other theme of who gets to be an artist and the sort of transformational power of art. So those are sort of the three themes, I think, that 
sort of were, that I would envisage were running through this and that I would have to sort of draw it out on my shoot days. I knew, you know, to get all that, I would have to capture a master interview probably from Terry. That would form, you know, the main skeleton of the edit. Then I'd ideally capture what I like to call some show and tell moments. When you're just sort of rolling with the camera and stuff is happening in front of you or people are showing you stuff and sort of talking about it. Um, I think that would they tend to sort of introduce moments of spontaneity and humor and off the cuff remarks. I've actually made a separate video about this whole technique. Um, I'll link it here or in the description if you want to watch it. But it's just a technique I like to, to use in all my documentaries to sort of break up that interview format um, and to bring the viewer into the world of my contributors. I decided to shoot this on my Red Komodo uh, using my DZO Vespid Primes and I also used ND filters and diffusion from Format High Tech. The reason I shot this on my Red was because it has obviously a lovely organic image, um, but I knew after doing the recce that the location had quite mixed and ropey lighting. And I just thought shooting internal raw on this camera would just give me the most flexibility in post to try and sort of correct that and pull skin tones back, you know, if anything weird was going on with all that mixed lighting. The other reason I wanted to film on this camera is that it's actually just really simple to operate when you're on your own. And I think when you're filming on your own and, and having to split your attention between lots of different tasks, you need to be able to set and trust your gear. Everything should be going on to sort of monitoring your audio, uh, your composition, and then primarily you want to be focusing on directing your characters, your subjects, um, and then interviewing them if, if that's what you're doing. So the studio space I was shooting in was also really cramped. So I decided to shoot it handheld so I could just be a bit more agile and move around quickly. So that meant uh, using my easy rig, which also has the benefit of obviously allowing me to take my hands off the camera, which again is really, really useful when you're filming on your own. Lens wise, I wanted to keep things simple again. So I just decided to bring uh, my focal reducer so I could get a slightly wider field of view. Um, and then I just brought the 40mm as my main lens and then I also had the 24mm for any sort of wide shots I wanted and then I brought the 75mm for close-ups. Lighting was a big concern, the space was very grungy and it sort of had two sets of lights which were all like slightly different color temperatures. There were lots of people working in there whilst I was filming so I couldn't turn the lights off. The first shoot day I brought my Aperture 300D Mark II. Uh, that's a daylight balance light and it didn't really work out because I couldn't really set my white balance on my camera properly. So that meant on the other days I actually ended up buying an Amaran, Amaran 200C. Basically that's a bicolor light um, and that allowed me just to sort of dial in a warmer color temperature and then sort of just better adjust my camera white balance to get better skin tones. Audio also was a big concern. I knew in the studio I'd be micing up at least two people on one of the days. I wanted a really small streamlined setup so I used my DJI mics uh, instead of my sort of larger road uh, filmmaker packs and I just repurposed the lav mics on my larger road set and used them on the DJI mics. And then the other benefit is that the DJI mics both go into a single receiver and that has a stereo output which I could put straight into my Komodo and get both channels of audio and I needed that simplicity. So yeah, in terms of sound quality, I guess it could have been better, but I just wanted to concentrate on getting the material that audio setup delivered for me. In total, there were three shoot days. Uh, the first two were sort of more observational style filmmaking, so mostly in the studio. And then the third day had a bit more structure to it. That's the day I plan to do my interviews on. Um, and then also the more staged lit cinematography with Terry in the studio on his own. I was quite nervous. I think Terry as well was quite nervous. This was obviously the first time we properly met. So it was quite like a hard start sort of me meeting for the first time and then bringing my big camera um, along and sort of shoving it in his face. Why is that important? I don't know. Is it like, do you feel a connection with the work? Yeah. And you can hear me trying to prompt Terry with questions, you know, get him talking about his artwork, what he likes, about working with clay, whether he thinks he's an artist. You know, all these things designed to try and get his perspective on making art, what it does for him. But again, you know, he was quite shy. He wasn't really giving me much back. So I sort of backed off and decided just to sort of, you know, just film around him and take it easy. And I think this day was much about sort of just understanding who he was. Uh, and a bit more about his personality than sort of trying to get everything from him on his first day. So just before lunch, a lot of the other members left the studio and it seemed at this point that Terry seemed to perk up a little bit. He was a little bit less shy, maybe because there weren't as many people around as there were before. So we managed to get like a little mini interview with Terry at this point, which was really good. We got 
um, some really nice insight into his attack and you know how it affected him and there were you know just a few other little off-the-cuff lines about his artwork and his philosophy and you know the fact that he didn't think he was an artist but now he does that ended up being some of the most poignant lines in the film so I'm really glad that that actually happened this my life story isn't it I could write a book if I could remember on the second day, Terry was working with Luca. They had this like really nice working relationship and friendship. They had some really great banter between them. I think the key here for me was to try and sort of pull out this cheekiness between them and their camaraderie. Often I'd be a bit cheeky myself and just sort of mirror their interactions, you know, and if Terry said something cheeky, I would maybe then ask Luca how he felt about it and just sort of, you know, try and stoke that dynamic. And then I just also made sure I got a good range of coverage for my edits. So, you know, like non-sync footage of hands and close-ups and stuff working. And, um, getting them to show stuff to the camera, shoot some stuff in 50 frames a second. Um, you know, if they were doing something specific, I would often give them some direction, maybe get them to slow something down or uh, so I could shoot it properly or, you know, repeat an action. To get things flowing, actually, as a sort of icebreaker, I got Terry to hold the camera and sort of interview Luca for a bit, and then vice versa, got Luca to interview Terry. What's your name, sir? <laughs> My name is Luca. Where do you come from? I live on the second floor. <laughs> <laughs> and act actually forms one of the most sort of like important quotes in the film. It was actually the quote that ended up sort of, in, you know, it became the title of the film and was the opening line that I used in the, in the pre-title bit. Terry. Yes. Tell us about you. In two words. Yeah. What is there to say? <laughs> what is there to I say? I am what I am. You are what you are. I am what I am. And I think that kind of just sums Terry up. You know, he's very matter of fact. He answers in very sort of short responses, but sort of very directly as well. And it just felt like um, a really nice way to open up the film. But the technique itself is a really nice way of serving as a bit of an icebreaker. Um, you know, getting some of the contributors behind the camera. I find it works really well with kids or anyone who's really nervous. And it can be a nice way to bring people into the filming process, you know, letting them get behind the camera, let, get, let them sort of regain some control over the situation. So how's the second day of filming been? A lot easier. Yeah. So by the final shoot day, I was really happy with all the wealth of material I had captured. That just sort of left meteor interviews, the master interviews that would sort of flesh out the detail, would sort of outline the story and the main structure and narrative of the piece. So. I was really keen over this period to make sure that Terry's voice was the dominant voice narrating across the video. So that meant shooting a controlled master interview with him. I was kind of like nervous about how well this would go because my experience with him so far is that he's not a very chatty person. When he does come out with stuff, they're often very witty and insightful, but sometimes coaxing responses out of him can be quite hit and miss. Tech, testing one, two, three. That's exactly what I wanted. Perfect, good man. That's all going well. I uh, enlisted the help of the studio manager, Michelle, to help run the interview. I gave her the questions I wanted asking, and then I got her to sort of interview Terry because they had a really close relationship. So the things I talked about, wanted to talk, cover about with uh, Terry were obviously his art project, his relationship with Luca, um, but then also, you know, details about him, about his philosophy on life. You know, I wanted to ask him whether he thought he was an artist. I, I thought that would be a really interesting question and he gave some really interesting responses. You know, what was his life like growing up? How did his life change, you know, after his injury? Um, what was it like, um, you know, working with Clay? What did it do for him? Stuff like that. And, you know, really flesh out who Terry was and get him telling him his own story. So I was really pleased with what we got from this interview. The setup for this interview didn't have a lot of time. So at sort of 3 p.m. we had to run around really quickly, set up all the lighting, clear the space, set up the camera, the tripod, all that sort of stuff. In the end, we only got an hour. I just sort of had a rough idea of where camera and Terry needed to be. So plonk the camera down, um, put the lighting how I normally light interviews. And then I also had my Aperture 300D on site. So I gelled that up to be a bit warmer and then used that as a little backlight as well. 
So for this section, I did actually get some help. I asked my partner, Steph, he very kindly came down and helped me for this. And the sequences I wanted to get with him afterwards were really to sort of go over the sense of uh, like Terry being lost in the process of sculpting and working with clay. So I wanted to have him spotlit in this sort of dark space with sort of quite dramatic and contrasty lighting, you know, with a lot of darkness and so that you are very much drawn to him to sort of really emphasize this, this idea of him getting lost in the process and, and him being one with, with the process. Um, but unfortunately, we just didn't have time to really sort of like get the full range of sequences that we wanted. So I wanted this footage to really play more of a part in the film than it ended up doing because we only really had 10 minutes to capture this. The interview probably took about 30 to 40 minutes and that left us really only about 15 minutes to reset lights, you know, haze the room. Uh, and then really sort of refine the setup. So 15 minutes just wasn't enough for that. Fortunately, we managed to get enough to feature at the beginning, at the end, and I do think this stuff worked really well, but I do wish we just, you know, we'd had an extra hour with him to sort of really dial this in and, and do it properly. Interviews, also on this third day, we shot interviews of Luca and the studio manager, Michelle. I knew the interviews had to be pretty simple. I wanted to get interviews to provide all the context in case uh, we couldn't get certain material from Terry's interview, just so all our bases were covered. With these interviews, I framed on mid shots or quite wide, so I could crop in on the interviews in the edit, basically get two shots. I shot in 6K. You know, it often takes people a little while to settle into the rhythm of, of an interview. So try to save the most important questions towards the end of the interview because people are going to be a lot more relaxed. Or, you know, you can, you can re-ask some of the questions from the beginning of the interview at the end. Generally with edits, I like to open with a quote. Uh, I usually like to find like a poignant line from an interview or a reaction or a piece of humor. As I find this really helps to draw an audience and encourage them to sort of stick around and sort of pull them into the edit. The rest of the edit was basically sort of compiling Terry's contributions from across the three days. Uh, and then sort of grouping them into thematic sections. So, you know, stuff about his early life, about the accident, about the art project, and then his own reflections on sort of becoming an artist and stuff like that. I usually work in Final Cut Pro 10. I pull my interviews or anything with recorded dialogue into an edit timeline. And then I just scrubble through or scroll through it really quickly, double speed, place markers on the timeline and write little notes about what's being said. Uh, I'll add little stars on the notes if it's a really important bit. And then, you know, when it comes to editing the project, it's kind of like having a mini timestamp transcript within the software. Uh, I've spun through all the material, so it's, you know, it's, it's fresh in my mind now. When I'm jumping through, you know, three days worth of footage, I can quickly look at these markers and tags and find the bits that I want to find. Unlike just looking at a text transcript, it's important to see you know, listen to how people say stuff, what their face is doing, you know, are they smiling, how they say it and all that sort of stuff. You know, something I've said throughout this piece is that I really wanted uh, to rely on Terry's own words as much as possible. I had obviously shot interviews with Luca and Michelle, kind of had got those as backups in case I couldn't get what I wanted from Terry. But when I was working in the edit, I realized that it would be really lazy to rely on those two interviews to sort of tell Terry's story. In the end, I actually decided to drop Michelle's interview, even though it was probably one of my favorite interviews on the project. It wasn't adding much to it in the sense that Terry was covering most of it anyway. I, this was probably like one of the nicest looking interviews as well, but again, it just wasn't serving the project. So I just decided uh, not to include it. I think that's another important lesson that sort of in the end, you sort of have to kill your darling sometimes and sort of let go of your ego. Close to the start of the film, we have a section where Terry talks about his injury. I knew that I wanted some sort of more abstract imagery to cover this section, but I didn't want it to be too sort of stylistically different from the rest of the film. So in the end, I ended up compositing the clean artwork shots with some underwater footage that I got from Artgrid. And then I just sort of played around with this, sort of adding textures, overlaying, compositing the stuff together until I got these like subtle bubbles and stuff moving over the artworks. And I really liked how that ended up in the end because, you know, his artworks reference stuff with coral reefs and the sea and the ocean. So it felt appropriate to sort of play with those visual references. A lot of the edit is also music, musically driven. I'm so used to doing this, but as I got further on in the edit, I did wonder whether this was the right approach. I make a lot of sort of online content that, you know, over the years has, has become more and more compressed and you've got to work with sort of music to keep it peppy. And this had begun to spill over into to work like this. And I realized that the whole film was sort of filled with music and it was quite fast paced. I do wonder whether I should have 
provided more space to listen to Terry and had less music and stuff in it. But because of this, towards the end of the edit process, I actually cut a little bridging section towards the end of the film that sort of moved the body of the film into the final section of the film. And for this, I just didn't use any music. I just used a bit of uh, some environmental Atmos sounds. And that was just to provide a bit of space and contemplation, just to give you time to breathe before sort of going into the, the final section of the film, which again has, has some ambient music. I really wanted a colorist to work on this piece. I didn't want to color it myself. I really wanted to benefit from collaborating with someone to pull the best out of it. Um, <laughs> obviously there wasn't a budget for that. So generally I didn't want the piece to look super clean. I didn't want to play with perfection, look too clinical. So yeah, I wanted to lean into a more organic grungy look to tie in with Terry's work, you know, clay, dirty hands, the sort of beautiful imperfection of our brains and bodies. Um, I didn't want it to be sort of, you know, clean and clinical. So most of the grade was based on a heavily modified version of the Film Vision Power Grade. Uh, I've got another video about how I use that here if you want to watch that. But yeah, it's just a great way to, to achieve a bit of a film emulation look, a bit of grunge, grungy film look in DaVinci Resolve. So yeah, I, it was maybe a little bit oversaturated, but Considering the amount of time and resources I had to put into it, yeah, I, I, you know, overall I was happy to get the film out. Uh, if I could change anything, yeah, like I said, I would have opted to work with a colorist on this. I just wish I'd had more time to shoot the stage shots. A larger sequence of shots with nice controlled lighting. I just wanted these to play a much larger role in the film. I just wanted to use these to sort of play around with the edit a bit more, be a bit more experimental. Um, but obviously, yeah, there just wasn't the time with Terry to do this. So I'm just happy we managed to pull some of these shots off. We basically had 10 minutes to execute them, so I can't be too hard on myself. And now we're a month on, watching the edit back. I think one of the key criticisms I have of it is that I'd really like to have slowed the whole thing down, probably used less music, spaced out the dialogue a bit more, and just, you know, make it a tiny bit more meditative in its rhythm. You know, there's a lot crammed into that edit. It's about five minutes, five and a half minutes. So I think just adding a bit more space would have allowed, you know, things to breathe a bit more, allowed the audience to sit with Terry's story for a bit longer. Because at the moment, it feels like the music really just drives it and pushes it forward quite quickly. Um, and, and the sort of shot duration as well, maybe just slow that down a bit and the cuts and stuff like that. But yeah, I think overall working on this project mainly just highlighted how much I miss working with crew or collaborators. You know, it can be quite lonely working on a project like this on your own. You've got to really motivate yourself, you've got to push yourself forward and then just really, you know, trust in yourself that you'll get over the humps along the way. You know, it took weeks before I was finally uh, happy with the edit and realized that the edit was going to work and it wasn't going to be a massive failure so you know you got to just keep pushing through all those those little road bumps and sort of believe in yourself a little bit so yeah the film screened at the barbican exhibition uh, i got a chance to catch up with terry and luca at the private view uh, and they were just really pleased with how it turned out luca gave me a huge hug and honestly i think just that's all that really mattered to me it was just one of the most special projects i think i'll get to work on this year and i'm just really privileged to have had the opportunity to work on it um anyway yeah i'd love to know what you thought about the piece and also about your own adventures in solo film uh, making so drop me a comment down below I'm also just interested like to know whether you enjoy these long form breakdowns it's kind of really long this video is anyone still watching to this point if you are drop a comment down below are you finding these videos useful was this too much too boring let me know in the comments down below but anyway yeah i'm ed uh, until next time, see ya!